when you're done, Alicia. Okay, go ahead. Live sound check number one, presenter's laptop.
Live sound check number one, presenter's laptop. Live sound check number two, clerk's laptop.
and we're live. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Governance Review Subcommittee. The date is August the 24th. We're just going to wait. A I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And we have a chief corner. Sorry. Thank you. I couldn't get in with the regular WebEx thing. I had to open up Outlook and go into the meeting. And yes. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry no, I'm welcome. late. Welcome. We just started. Um, I would like to call the meeting to order. Um, members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. As well, a reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. Members are reminded of the five-minute five time limit, which will be adhered to during this meeting. Members can submit another request to speak if they require more time to ask questions or make comments. As noted uh, just moments ago, we have quorum, um, and we will um, move ahead um, on the approval of the agenda. Elsie McRae, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair, there are changes to the agenda. There's one added commu communication item, which is 5.1 correspondence from Viv Saunders respecting ward office budgets and policy guidelines with a recommendation to be received and referred to consideration of item 10.1, which is Councillor Ward Office Budgets and Policy Guidelines for Eligible Expenses for Elected Officials, which is FCS 18083C. Uh, there's an added delegation request, which is Cameron Croach respecting the proposed amendment to the procedural bylaw referred by Council on August 13th, 2021 to the Governance Review Subcommittee uh, regarding special meetings of Council, and that is for today's meeting. There's an added discussion item, which is that item 10.2, which is the proposed amendment to the procedural bylaw, which was referred from Council August 13th, 2021 to Governance Review Subcommittee respecting special meetings of Council. And uh, please note that for item 10.1, which is Council Ward Office Budgets and Policy Guidelines for Eligible Expenses for Elected Officials, mm -hmm. FCS 18083, it has been revised as there's an error on page one. That has been actually further revised this morning. It has not been uploaded yet. It will be uploaded immediately after the meeting. And I'm happy to share my screen, but it should now read... Uh, under the sponsorship bullet, sponsorships and donations will not be allowed from the first day that nominations can be filed for candidates until the day after the election. So I'm happy to share my screen when we are on that item. And that's all. Thank you, Elsie McRae. Uh, it is moved by Councillor Vanderbeek and seconded by Councillor Ferguson to approve the agenda as amended. Any discussions on the amended agenda? I don't see any hands and I don't see any note in the chat. So if we can have an e-vote on that, please. And that carries for nothing. Thank you. Committee, any declarations of interest this morning? Seeing none. Uh, approval of the July 14th 2021 minutes may have a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. To approve those minutes, any discussion? Seeing none. And that carries for nothing. Thank you. Um, as noted by uh, Elsie McRae, we have uh, communication items from Viv Saunders. The recommendation is it be received and referred. May I have a mover and a seconder on communication item 5.1? Moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by myself. Any discussion? Thank you. Councillor Clark and, oh, Councillor Ferguson. And that carries for nothing. Thank you. 6.1, Cameron uh, has a delegation res uh, re request respecting the proposed amendment to the procedural bylaw referred by Council on August 13th of this year to the governance review to this committee. Um, it is moved by Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor Ferguson to approve the delegation request. Any discussion yet? No, thank you.
And that carries for nothing. Thank you. No problems. Okay, uh, on to item nine on the agenda, public hearings or delegations. Before we begin, members are reminded that questions of the delegations are for clarification purposes only and not for debate. Um, Cameron, are you with us this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I've been having some internet troubles. I can hear you just fine. I can also see you. Um, and just a reminder, uh, when you commence, it's uh, five minutes. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you. I will share my screen if that's okay. Thank you. So I mean with you to discuss the changes to sections 3.4 and 3.5 of the city's procedural bylaw that are proposed for you today. And my suggestion is that you not make changes to 3.4 as suggested. Why? Because this is a change to special meetings of council, right? So this is gonna change the way that special meetings of council are permitted to be called. And it's clear right now, the way the procedural bylaw is set up, that there are limits in place. There are limits in place for how special meetings can be called. Although the municipal act does say pretty broadly, the head of council may at any time call a special meeting. That's the broad municipal act suggestion here. However, the current procedural bylaw limits that by saying that there must be written direction to the clerk stating the date, time, and purpose of the special meeting, that the clerk shall summon a special meeting, the clerk shall give notice of at least two days before the time appointed for the meeting. But what's on today's agenda for proposal is that there be a second class of special meeting created called an urgent and extraordinary occasion special meeting where no notice is required to be given. Why I think this is a really big problem is because on a majority of council, meaning uh, the mayor and another, enough other members to make a majority, could on immediate notice create uh, a special meeting, hold that special meeting, vote on something that would require two thirds of council to undo. I don't think this is democratic and makes much sense. Um, I don't think there's a need for this specifically because one-off rules like this to address individual circumstances make for bad policy is my main point. Like this appears to be reacting to something, um, reacting to a specific instance. I don't think those kinds of reactions make good policy. There's no evidence that I've seen to suggest that this is needed or necessary um, as part of a revision. I haven't seen that. Um, there's also already a provision for urgent and extraordinary circumstances. It's called an emergency meeting. That already exists as part of the municipal act. Why would there be another class of special meeting created that says extraordinary and urgent when you already have a class of an emergency meeting existing to, to invoke those, those powers? So I think that would weaken the a definition of an emergency meeting and would cause, frankly, a lot of confusion. Like what does extraordinary and what does urgent mean? And would you need new definitions in your bylaw to determine what's different between urgent extraordinary and emergency. So it's just clouding the bylaw up after the clerk just last year, after my recommendation introduced a definition for an emergency meeting, which didn't exist before. So I think we're going backwards, not forwards. It also limits the public and council's access if these means can be called like this. So I think removing the timeline is not good. This power should only be employed for bona fide emergencies and nothing else, not for special meetings. Um, I think this also has a huge impact on this, the emergency provision in, in the bylaw, which is section 3.5. And right now, the issue with that is there's no timing limits placed on, the, on, on that meeting. So, and I'll be brief because I know my time is running out soon, but the issue here is an emergency is called, but who decides what's an emergency? Like, how is that arrived at? Is it at the call of the clerk to, to look at the reason the meeting's being called and compare it to the language that's in the procedural bylaw, which by the way, was taken out of the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, though no one seems to know that because it's not listed in the bylaw, but I would just mention that. This out of context definition, right? Who's checking the definition of what an emergency is to determine whether or not it's a bona fide reason to call a meeting? What happens when, for instance, I'll just skip ahead to the end, is it necessary to call a Monday emergency meeting when there's a regular meeting scheduled for Friday? Who determines that it's bona fide? Who determines that it's necessary? How does any of that work? So when you're gonna go down this road of further splitting up the definition of an emergency into emergency, urgent, and extraordinary, I think you have to consider all these things and really 
make sure you understand what powers you're giving away um, and how council as a whole can both check those powers and make sure that they're used responsibly. Thanks. Thank you, Cameron. That was um, under the five minute. So thank you. Just looking to my notes here. Um, uh, are there any questions from uh, committee members for, for Cameron? I recognize Councillor Vanderbeek. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, through you to Cameron, um, I think in the meeting that we, where we discussed this with the entire committee, uh, I think it was general issues recently, um, there was quite a bit of discussion about, you know, what's an emergency meeting? What isn't an emergency meeting? Um, how would the notice be given? How would they determine how, you know, how, how whether it's an emergency meeting and whether or not two thirds of council are in agreement to having the special meeting? Um, <clears throat> I do see that there may be opportunities, and I'll call it something different. There may be situations where something has to be dealt with legally or something, just to use an example, where, you know, our legal department brings something in camera and we need to resolve it in order for them to be able to move forward in a timely way that that was somehow somewhat unexpected. So the two days notice, um, which is reasonable in almost every circumstance to me, um, is not enough time perhaps. So how can the mayor and council deal with that if that's a necessity? So I understand staff's recommendation that, you know, the, in other words, it would be determined by council. What he wasn't clear about in the meeting, and so I'm asking your opinion about this, I guess, is under that kind of a situation, if there was a clear procedure for council, in other words, two thirds of council must agree that this is an actual emergency that requires no notice to the public, that perhaps notice to the public might not even be something that um, would make a difference to the public other than hearing it, which they would do if there was a special meeting and they knew about it, of course. Uh, anyway, if they were at a, at, a, at a meeting where something like that came forward. Um, I'm wondering if there was a clear procedure for how staff determined the two thirds of council who would need to be in agreement that this is the reason and this is a valid reason to have an immediate council meeting after a meeting where staff brings something forward that's that's urgent in their eyes. Um, would that would that make a difference in what you're presenting today? In your in your um, I mean, I'm assuming that you, from what I've heard today and what I understand about what you're saying, you would like to have seven, item seven, which is the notwithstanding subsection 3.43 removed. I'm asking if it wasn't removed, but it was clear about how that determination was made, would that be something that you would consider as a valid reason to, to perhaps leave some form of this in the procedure bylaw, Cameron? Mr. Crutch. That's my main, my main complaint, I would say, or my main concern is that um, it's not clear based on that paragraph what the procedure is. You talked about it in public, um, but it's not written down. I have no idea and the public has no idea. And I don't think the majority of council have any idea how um, these decisions are exactly made and what constitutes an emergency. Like why isn't the emergency provision good enough for an emergency meeting. Like if there's a bona fide illegal emergency that's gonna put the city in absolute harm's way that needs to be dealt with immediately that day, it can't wait um, two days and it can't wait till the end of a week. Okay, like what is that situation? And why can't that be provided for under the emergency provision provisions, right? Like if those are the kinds of emergencies the city is facing, they should be in the city's bylaws, right? Like if those are the situations that you're facing, they should be there. And there should be a really clear process for who makes the decision that something fits the definition and why you've taken the definition from that act and just copied it into the bylaw as the definition. Like there's a whole context to that whole act, right? Like you can't just copy a definition of an, an unrelated act, throw it in there um, and say, that's our emergency definition. 
um, without some context or some reference. So I think that you have to, when you're evaluating how you add this section 7 to 3.4, you have to ask yourself what exists in 3.5. So I think a, a, like a fulsome analysis with some evidence-based research done on 3.4 and 3.5 with a report that comes back that identifies these loopholes and how they can be tightened up would be the most responsible way to deal with this. I think just slapping this in here, um, which seems frankly, again, reactive to a one-off situation is like not the way to make policy, in my opinion. Thank you, Cameron. Those are my questions. Thank you, Councillor Van Der Beek. Um, members of subcommittee, are there any additional questions? Um, I have one question if I could ask Councillor Ferguson as a chair of AFNA to take the chair from me, please. Certainly, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Cameron, just to go back to that uh, definition that you used in the, is it uh, again, enlighten me in the Emergency Measures um, Act, if you could confirm that. And the second question I have, if you're able, um, how would this uh, proposal um, that was suggested, um, uh, how do other municipalities, uh, to your knowledge, deal with this? Is this would this uh, be an anomaly, or is it the norm? Does that make sense in my question? Please and thank you. Sure. Um, it's the definition that, as I understand it, and the city clerk could confirm this, that the procedural bylaw contains a definition of emergency that is copied from the Emergency Management and the Civil Protection Act. I just did a Google search to try and find that, and that's that's what the comparison I came up with. Um, so the clerk could certainly confirm that. And I believe it's been stated publicly that's the case. That's where the definition comes from, though there's no reference there. Um, sorry, your second question I forgot, and I apologize. No, no problem. So sorry, just on that point, if I could, through you, Chair, you're saying that a procedural bylaw doesn't reference where that um, definition is coming from, just so I understand. Yes? Are you confirming that? Right, it doesn't. Um... Okay, thank you. So my 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 second question um, was uh... right. It doesn't currently make reference to where definitions come from or how they're arrived at. Thank you. So there's not a clear indication of where the definition comes from. Okay, my, my second question. Um, I know I wasn't clear. Um, other municipalities, if you're familiar with um, their procedural bylaws, uh, is this suggestion in keeping with the practice or is this an, an extraordinary one? Thank you. Those are my questions. Given this short window of time, I didn't have time to do a lot of research yeah, into this specific enough. exception, to be honest, like there wasn't the time, um, whether or not the powers of the mayor have been expanded. I know that in our procedural bylaw, there are a number of instances that expand the powers of the mayor. Um, in my report, in 2021, 2019, all the way back to 2017, I've been saying the same thing over and over, which is I don't think those powers should continue to be expanded. Um, I don't have on hand from memory, I'm sorry, um, but I did look at some other bylaws. There are some other bylaws in other places that do have similar language to expanding the powers of the mayor, but about the specific issue of whether special meetings are gonna be urgent or extraordinary, like that specific amendment you're making, mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'm not sure. Thank you. I'll turn the chair back over to. Thank you. Members, I don't see anyone um, with a request to, to ask a question. So on behalf of the subcommittee, thank you very much, Cameron, for your willingness to delegate and participate. Okay, um, Elsie McRae, did I? Um, move uh did i receive a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation not yet madam chair okay it is moved by councillor vanderbeek seconded by councillor ferguson to receive mr crutch delegation and that carries for nothing thank you we're on to items now 10.1 councillor ward office budgets and policy guidelines for eligible expenses for elected officials. Um, a mover and a seconder to put the item on the floor. Moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by myself. A discussion on this item, please. Uh, 
I recognize Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chairman. I'm just trying to get back to the details. Yep. Um, under Appendix A, it's a very comprehensive, long document, uh, 13 pages. I was hoping there would be a bolded part that would show the, the proposed changes. But when I look at the, um, at the report itself, it looks like you're focusing in on sponsorships after August 31st. I thought we always had that. Capital related expenses, uh, all purchases must be adhered to city's procurement policy. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with that one. Uh, Councillor's ward budget process and guided staffing expenses for sick time. That is new and um, it, it, and I just wonder if staff could explain what this means. So if you're off on long-term disability and um, you know, your executive assistants take over and generally neighboring counselors covered for you. What would that cost be that we don't already have? Thank you, uh, Councillor Ferguson. I see Mr. Zagarek has is on the screen and I assume that means he's going to take the question. Thanks. Good morning. Thanks, Chair. Good morning. Mike Zagarek, General Manager of Finance Corporate Services. Uh, I can start, uh, Chair, and then if uh, Brian McMountain uh, or Amanda would like to add on, I just invite them uh, to the conversation. Um, to the councillor's question, the report that's before you today stems from a direction from committee and council, uh, and that direction came about through previous practice, whereby if a councillor was potentially going to have a negative year end variance, uh, and I'll use the factor driving factor being a leave of absence, either maternity leave or short term disability leave. Uh, typically, counselors will work uh, across counselors offices to try to offset that uh, that gap in terms of resources or may be required to backfill that position. The challenge counselors have had in the past is backfilling those positions. Uh, there is not a, uh, a dedicated funding source or backfilling positions that come about because of a maternity leave or short-term disability leave. And the pressure that creates for counselors' offices is that under the guidelines, if there were to be a year-end deficit in that ward office, that particular counselor would have the obligation to reimburse the city as a corporation for the, uh, for the year-end variance. And uh, and so, uh, again, aligning the board offices with city departments, I'll, I'll make the comparison to city departments. Uh, city departments in the case where we have staff who may be on maternity leave or, um, or may be on short-term disability leave, uh, counselors will be familiar with the term gapping will use gapping savings that may come about because of other employee related savings to offset that uh, those pressures. Unfortunately, given the size of counselors uh, ward office budgets, uh, the ward office budgets don't necessarily have that capacity to offset those pressures. So uh, again, recognizing that in the past, this has created the need for ward counselors to bring forward motions to uh, fund those pressures, either through the legislative budgets or through the tax stabilization um, reserve, uh, recognizing that, uh, that these pressures are going to occur from time to time and recognizing that the ward office budgets uh, are fairly limited as it relates to mitigating these pressures staff are recommending that uh, any costs associated with maternity leaves or short-term disability leaves not apply to the counselor's obligation to reimburse the corporation as it relates to potential year-end variances. Okay, so, so it's, it's directed, Mike, more towards employees of counselor's offices, not necessarily counselors, because I don't think it's possible to backstop a counselor. So if, if an executive assistant goes on mat leave, when they collect mat leave, I believe that's funded by the Unemployment Insurance Commission unless we top them up, I'm not sure. And, and, and so what cost would there be if, 
uh, the person on the mat leave is, is collecting UIC or um, employment insurance EI. I'm aging myself. Yes. With, with so, old so, acronym. so through the chair, one of the driving factors is not necessarily the absent employees uh, cost, but the cost to backfill that position. So mm -hmm. if a assistant is on a maternity leave, uh, and recognizing that maternity leave could last for extended period is while counselors will work, uh, you know, uh, collaboratively across offices is a leave of that length or duration uh, may create some challenges. So consequently, counselors look to backfill those positions with part time staff. And the intent of this policy is that that cost to backfill that position with part time staff does not become an obligation for the counselor in the case where there's a year-end uh, deficit in that counselor's office. I'm just wondering, Mike, how you police this. Hey, right now, you come, they bring resolutions to council, so it's very transparent. Uh, we won't see this later. And if, a, if an EA goes off on mat leave, the salary originally paid to that uh, um, count, uh, EA would go then to the backstop to play because the other one goes off on the EI. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, not in the case of maternity leaves or short-term disabilities. So in the case of long-term disability, there uh, that funding capacity remains in the ward uh, counselor's office, but in the case of maternity leave and short-term disability leave, those costs are uh, are charged to the ward counselor's office. Okay, I've, I'll wait to see if any other members of, of the committee have any questions. Thank you. My, my recollection at the time this was discussed, there were concerns raised with um, privacy, um, employee privacy, and also um, leaving it to the political will of whether someone uh, could uh, go on that leave um, or so. But I recognize Councillor Clark. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Wilson. You're absolutely correct. That was the, the genesis of this. So can I ask staff a couple of questions then? Um, if we approve this policy, council will not see in the future resolutions from a ward counselor to fund the long-term disability for their employee or mat leave for their employee or even short-term disability for their employee we're not going to have to be coming to council and raising the individual's name and what the concern is and asking council to decide whether or not that issue is funded mr sagari through it through the chair that's correct as it relates to uh maternity leave and short-term disability leave. In the past, it was those leaves uh, that were contributing to the councillors having previously coming to council and disclosing that uh, members of their office and recognizing a board councillor's office may represent only two individuals. Uh, a member of their office was going on a maternity leave or short-term disability leave, creating a financial pressure and consequently in the past, they would have gone to council seeking council support to fund that financial pressure, either through the legislative budget or through a reserve. Thank you for that. That is a significant improvement. I heard you mention that it doesn't apply to long-term disability. I may have heard you wrong. Can you elaborate? So through the, uh, through the chair, uh, the ward offices are responsible for costs incurred during a short-term uh, disability and a maternity leave, but the ward offices are not charged the cost as it relates to long-term disability. Those are dealt okay. with corporately. And so that is why in the report that's before you is we are recommending that this apply to maternity leave and short-term disability leave. So uh, the last question, if I may, Chair. The policy that we have in place for elected official employees, so their staff, is that now congruent with how we treat all city staff with regards to short-term disability 
and maternity leave, it's the exact same policy. Thank you. Through the chair, it is, and that's why I made reference to fairness uh, as it relates to city departments, uh, recognizing city departments have greater financial capacity to try to mitigate or offset an award counselor's office is given the size of the budget and given that employee re related expenses represents the majority of the expenses in the award office uh, budget is the capacity just was not there uh, in mm -hmm. the past as it relates to maternity leave and short term disability leave. So again, this is uh, aligned with the practice as it relates to city departments. So Chair, a, a quick comment. I think this mm -hmm. is a significant improvement. Um, a number of us had raised concerns in the past about having to go to council and in public, mm -hmm. basically out an employee who was on maternity leave or a, uh, an employee who was on short, short term or long term disability. Um, and it's not appropriate. I mean, it's not appropriate under the laws in Ontario, and it's just certainly not appropriate in terms of good labor relations with our staff and our employees. They deserve privacy for these issues. So this goes a long way to resolving that issue. And I want to thank our staff for for uh, looking into this matter and, and coming up with the solution. So thank you, Mr. Zagarek and, and all of the staff who participated in that. Thank you, Chair. Those are all my questions and comments. Thank you. I happen to concur. Um, members, are there any additional questions? Because uh, I have some, but I will wait until the floor is exhausted. If I could ask Councillor Ferguson to take the chair, please. Go ahead. It's fly swatter, which is very threatening. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm trying to get them all. <laughs> yeah, it's a good chair thing. Um, if I could ask, uh, on this report, please, uh, through you, Chair, to Mike or whomever, could I have a definition of um, the election campaign period, technically? When does that? Through the Chair, I, th I think I'm going to invite uh, Anya, our Manager of uh, Elections, to uh, to define our election period. Thank you. Through the chair, um, the election period begins upon nomination. The nomination period begins May 1st, and then it runs through to the election, which would be October 24th, 2022. Uh, thank you. And um, so thank you for that. As a consequence, then uh, the amendment makes sense. Um, I do have a question, if I could, then on newsletters. Um, believe it says, Chair, that newsletters cannot be distributed after August 31st in an election year, and expenses incurred to produce or distribute election campaign literature or material will not be paid for by the city. So I, I'm trying to um, uh, think, connect those two dots. If we're putting a deadline of August 31st, um, you know, one could argue that a ward newsletter during an election year is, is a campaign, is campaign material. So I'm, I'm trying to reconcile um, this distinction without a difference, in my opinion. Um, if you wouldn't mind it apprising me on the on your uh, on your rationale for that Anya. yeah thank you sure yeah um we did a review of other municipalities and and you know how they've positioned this and so you know uh, many of the municipalities that we looked at tried to make a distinction between uh campaigning versus regular work of council and, uh, and we felt that, you know, if newsletters are allowed, they really shouldn't be used for the purposes of campaigning, but the recommendation around October or August 31st is really to allow counselors to continue to perform uh, their role as a counselor. So it really is trying to make that distinction between, you know, regular council work and, and representing the community versus campaigning. And so if there is a need for a newsletter, we felt that uh, in line with other municipalities that uh, that should be allowed to continue. 
And thank you. Um, so that I'm clear through you, Chair, um, this language uh, envisages a paper newsletter. Would the same um, apply to uh, an, you know, a regular e newsletter that some of us um, use? Through you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Um, through the chair, uh, my my definition would be newsletter, so it would include paper first and as well um, internet based electronic based newsletters. Okay, um, I I have a little discomfort uh, in in that. Um, I I see the I see I can see your point that um, it's our duty to convey public policy and our positions um, at the same time it is necessarily um, uh, an advantage if you will of incumbency to to be able to do that and have it paid for out of a ward budget during an election campaign um, i have another question if i could through you um, it's just <laughs> A little question. I noticed in the appendix, and I'm going to try and find it now, so give me a minute, just the history behind it, that the city will pay for, um, in lieu of flowers for a funeral, the city pays for a charitable donation. What, what is the, the rationale for using taxpayers' money to pay for ward councillors' decisions on funeral um, activity? I'm getting that right. Thank you. It's on page seven, sorry, Anya, of Appendix A. Through the chair, I think I'm going to defer that one to uh, Mike or Brian. I can't answer that. So, so through the chair, um, I think the councillors characterize this correctly. It is historical and uh, as uh, the practice has changed from uh, families wishing to have donations rather than uh, flower arrangements is uh, some time ago we amended the policy to capture and recognize that uh, that request from from either uh, family members of employees or elected officials so um, as the councillors identified this is more of a historical practice as it relates to providing the opportunity for flower arrangements or donations to the preferred charity of choice. Um, I'm, I'm trying to in this one, I'm, I'm trying not to be a stickler, but I'm, I'm trying to envision what public interest is served by having um, the public pay for flowers. If a ward counselor um, wishes to, to do so, I, I would think that would there be there choice, but I, I'm not sure why the city um, would be paying for either. Uh, and I would um, I'll leave it to my other colleagues to comment on it, but it's not something that um, I, I, I can get my head around. Um, so I through did. the chair, if I could just just to add on to my previous response, uh, beyond the ward offices, the city of Hamilton does have a practice through HR. Mm -hmm. uh, as well, that flower arrangements are sent on behalf of the city of Hamilton as well. Uh, so it's not exclusive to the ward office budgets in terms of eligibility, but the city of Hamilton also coordinates through, I believe, HR, a uh, recognition uh, flower arrangement in the case of a deceased uh, active employee. Yep, and I would certainly understand that and I would probably even understand the, the head of council having that ability, but I'm, I'm not sure why, why individual ward councillors would have um, that subsidized. Thank you, Mr. Zagarek. I have one final question, um, and it, it relates to um, ac accessing um, public facilities during an election campaign. If I could ask Chair through you to, to Mike or Anya, if you could just clarify that for me. Are um, um, 
uh, elected persons or candidates allowed to use public facilities during um, an election period? Thank you. City mm -hmm. uh, facilities. Through the chair, um, they are not for campaign purposes. Okay. Is that new, if I could ask? Because I'm, I'm just thinking we, we have a facility in, in Ward 1 in West Hill in particular that I know um, was used by candidates in the past. So is that um, through the chair, I'm going to defer to Mike. Mike, I'm, I'm hoping you can answer this one. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Uh, through the chair, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint Anya. I don't know as it relates to whether or not candidates uh, have the opportunity to rent city facilities versus uh, utilizing city facilities uh, um, at no cost. So again, as it relates mm -hmm. to any candidates, uh, there may be a capacity to rent city yeah, facilities. I, uh, I believe the report and the guidelines that are before you is to, in an effort to try to create fairness, is not to provide the incumbent with an advantage as it relates to access and utilization of city facilities. Thank you. Um, those are those are my my questions, um, Chair. I'll take the chair back. I just uh, okay. it's all any, yours. Any comments from your colleagues on those same items or others? Thank you. I don't uh, see any. Um, so. Um, I would uh, propose an amendment, uh, particularly in reference to Appendix A and the public subsidization of flowers or charities. I, I'm, I'm just not comfortable with that. And um, if uh, I think the amendment would read that we um, strike that. So if I, I don't have a seconder, and I know I'm not <laughs> giving you any heads up, but it's just I'm not sure I understand why that is um, an allowed expense during the election year, especially. Okay, I'll take the chair back again then uh, during the amendment. Oh, yes, so there's, sorry. A, there's an amendment on the floor. So is there a seconder to the amendment? Seeing none, so the motion um, falls in. So yeah, I'll turn the chair back to you. Uh, thank thank uh, you. Councillor. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Okay. We need uh, an electronic vote to approve. Uh, can I ask Elsie McRae? I'm sorry. Is um, we have to approve the amendment first? Uh, so, well, there wasn't an amendment. So, just oh. the recommendation that Appendix A to Report FCS 18083C um, be approved. So, I have a mover. You, Would, you got a mover and seconder on that also already. Sorry, with that change to the date, though, right? Well, that that the report will be revised, and I will have that up on the website. But that's not part of the recommendation. Um, so you, the revision will be reposted correctly after the meeting, um, as I stated in the changes. But that's not part of the recommendation. The recommendation is just to approve Appendix A. Oh yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Shall I open the vote? Please. And that carries for nothing. Okay, thank you. Um, we're on to item 10.2, colleagues. Proposed amendment to the procedural bylaw referred by Council August 13th, 2021 to the Governance Review Subcommittee respecting special meetings of Council. Um, at the August 13th Council meeting, section 3.47 respecting special meetings was referred. Um, should, do I need to read that out, Elsie uh, McRae? 
uh, to the chair, not necessarily. I'm happy to share my screen at any point if we're wanting to uh, look at it or discuss it further. Okay, may I have a mover and a seconder to put the item on the floor? Moved by Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Clark, if I could, to get it on the floor. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, thank you, Angela, for some help. So, Councillor Clark's on the speaker's list. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Beg your pardon. Thank you. Um, so when I look at our procedural bylaw, it has a definition for an emergency meeting. And when I look at 3.4 that we're dealing with today, I can't find the definition for a special meeting. So how do we determine, or how does the mayor determine a special meeting of council versus it being an emergency meeting of council. So it seems like we have three classifications of, of meetings now, regular standard meeting, an emergency meeting can be called by the mayor or a special council meeting can be called by the mayor. Thank you, um, uh, LC McRae, who is here to help us today on this? Oh, uh, so to the chair, Janet, uh, the deputy clerk. Thank you, Deputy Clerk. Through the chair, Councillor Clark, um, a special council meeting would be any other meeting other than a, in the regular uh, meeting schedule that's been approved by council. So mm -hmm. that, like any meeting other than those meetings in that regular um, calendar would be considered special. And when it's a special, thank you for that, when it is a special council meeting, the two days notice applies, correct? Correct. But if we're having an emergency meeting that the mayor calls, it, 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 it's not necessary for the two day notice, correct? Correct. I'm sorry for asking these, but I'm thinking out loud. I apologize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, no, I appreciate it. Um, and so we have an emergency meeting, we have a special meeting of council, and then we have item seven, uh, which is proposing notwithstanding 3.3, 3.4, which is a special meeting of council and an urgent and extraordinary occasion with the consent of the majority of councillors, recording the minutes, a special meeting of the council may be called the mayor without notice to consider and deal with such urgent and extraordinary matters. So now we have this meeting that seems to be separate from an emergency meeting because not everything falls under the definition of an emergency meeting. And so then we have this new classification of a, a special meeting, which is an urgent and extraordinary meeting. Is that what I'm trying to, does that make sense? Uh, Deputy Clerk, are you able to comment please? I, through the chair, yes, that is correct. It's another classification of a meeting. Okay, and so my concern to my colleagues um, is twofold. Um, 3.4.3, um, I would propose that councillors should be getting more than a, a one-line notice telling them that there is a um, special meeting of council being called and this is what it's about. And Perhaps I'm being a bit facetious, but the notification to the councillors should be included, should include some form of a staff report or something that is addressing the matter that is going to be before them. And I don't see that anywhere in the procedural bylaw. And I'm still having um, questions about item number seven. And and as it is written, we can be called into a meeting at any time by the mayor um, with the vote of the majority of council, which I, which I understand, but there's nothing making it a prerequisite that the councillors receive a report about the issue that is going to be debated or deliberated upon. 
and those are my two concerns and I'm happy to hear from the rest of my colleagues and you can put me on for a second time after that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other comments or questions from um, our colleagues? Oh, recognize yes. Councillor Vanderbeek. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm not struggling as much with uh, three um, with not having a full report when you have two days notice, at least you have time to get something or to find out what it's about. I'm not struggling with that as much as I am struggling with number seven where, um, and I think I understand, I think I understand why staff are bringing this forward. What, what I am struggling with is there's nothing here that says that counselors need to respond before that special meeting is, is, is declared urgent or extraordinary. There needs to be something that goes to counselors. And I think it needs to be spelled out specifically here so that the public understands and so that council understands exactly what this third category is about. And, and I think there needs to be uh, the need for counselors to respond so that there is two thirds that agree that this, this, the reason for this urgent and extraordinary calling of a special council meeting with, without any notice to anyone um, is happening. And that we all agree that it is urgent and it is extraordinary and that it isn't necessarily going to um, impede our transparency to the public. Because, I mean, even two days is short notice if someone's busy or, you know, away or whatever, but, but at least it is two days notice. And I think that the notice is, I mean, I think in, in every other respect, we are required to provide notice of meetings to provide a, 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 to have a meeting with no notice, I think there has to be clear direction about who's going to make that determination. And the determination, in my opinion, should be made by the majority of council. It should be a council decision that this is the good reason to have an extraordinary or an urgent matter dealt with, with no notice to the public. And, and so I'm struggling with an item that just simply says generally that with the consent of the majority of all members of council, uh, the mayor can call an urgent and extraordinary meeting and have it this afternoon. I do understand that there could be reasons why we would have an urgent and extraordinary reason to have an immediate meeting. But I think that the, the that council, and honestly, it probably should be more than two thirds, but the council has to agree that this is a reason to have an urgent and extraordinary meeting called immediately. And I don't see that in here. And so, so to just wipe this clause out today um, means there's no opportunity to have that explained to us and to the public and make that decision. And that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, just so I'm clear in this, uh, Janet, um, the current number seven says you need the consent of a majority. Uh, so at least a simple majority, nine uh, members of council have to respond and say they agree. Is that correct? Through the chair, that's correct. So that the, but Councillor Vanderbeek is asking for consent to be changed to two thirds of the majority of members of council. And just through you, Madam Chair, to uh, Councillor Vanderbeek, is that what you're looking for to change that word two thirds from a majority? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor. I'm looking for something that is more than just a simple majority so that, that, that we're sure that the, that, that that this has been vetted. The, the, the reason for an urgent and extraordinary meeting to be called with absolutely no notice to the public 
has been vetted and that 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 we almost completely agree. In other words, almost the whole council agrees that. So two thirds is is um, I'm just looking for something here that assures the public that 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 there's nothing to do with our current mayor, but that some some rogue issue might come up by you know someone that that down the road in 40 years or whenever uh, might really push and have political push to get a meeting quick today, same day, tomorrow morning, whatever, without any notice to the public. Um, I think it's just protection for ourselves and for the public that, that, that at least a large proportion of us agree that there was a good reason to do this. And I think- Madam Chairman, I, I have no problem if Councillor Van Der Beek wants to change the word majority to two thirds. If I, I'd be happy to second that if she wants to move that amendment, but I, I like the rest of it. I think you need the ability, for example, what's happening on Thursday. I think we need to deal promptly with that, uh, the whole issue of the vaccination. So uh, I'm okay with the way it is, but I can live with changing majority to two thirds. So through you to Janet, yeah. typically would you get two thirds anyway? Has that been your experience? It has been our experience. What uh, we monitor the approval from council by the number of members that respond that they've accepted the meeting. Correct. So that provides us with either the majority or the two thirds. So that's what we would monitor in this case. Okay. So I have no problem with Council Van Der Beek wants to change the word majority to two thirds um, of the council. And but it also I'm like her. I'm 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 okay with no report because when this happens, it's generally a one-topic issue, and staff wouldn't have time to get anything scrambled together in two days. But uh, and, and most of the time it involves a pretty serious political decision, which is the case on Thursday. I don't know whether staff will or will not have her report, but it's a decision that council has to make. So I'm okay with it the way it is, but I would support an amendment to two thirds. Thanks. And I'll be happy to move that at the appropriate time, Madam Chair. Um, Councillor Clark wanted you to come back to him. Mm -hmm. So he may have some other things to say. I'm happy to hear them. Uh, thank you. I will recognize Councillor Clark as a second time speaker, but, but I do have a question myself. If I could ask Councillor Ferguson, please take the chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, on the two thirds, uh, I recall asking this question uh, when we deliberated this and um, I would ask if I could not, not to dismiss the deputy clerk, but um, I see that our solicitor is um, available and uh, if I recall the answer he provided to me for the rationale for a majority. Um, please, if I could ask Mr. Sparkling. Mr. Sparkling. Um, certainly through the chair to Councillor Wilson, uh, the exercise of discretion by council is usually a simple majority. And that's the reason why item seven is crafted in the fashion that it has. We get into a greater vote requirement in order to change the will of council as been expressed. So reconsideration items usually require two thirds. And from a municipal exposure perspective, generally initial exercise of discretion is simple majority. Uh, that isn't to say that you couldn't put a higher standard in place, but most organizations, uh, when they look at municipal governments, look at the original exercise of discretion in the absence of the will of council being stated as being a simple majority requirement. Thank you. Oh, sure. um, thank you. My, my second question, um, oopsie, um, go, goes back to the, f the fundamentals um, of what constitutes uh, this third category. And I believe Councillor Clark used uh, the phrase, not everything falls under the definition, or my, perhaps it was Janet, not everything would fall under the definition of an emergency meeting. And I'm still having a hard time understanding what possibly couldn't fall under the definition of an emergency meeting? Uh, that's my first question. And my second question is, um, I'm struggling very much with information um, not being provided for the context to inform my decision as a member of council on whether I believe it in fact is um, an extraordinary um, event. 
And I would surmise that if we can't have that rationale provided to us immediately and the emergency meeting is going to be called pretty quickly, uh, there's going to have to be some uh, professional rationale or details, facts provided at that special meeting. And I don't see why it cannot be provided some context in the notice um, to justify it. I, I'm really struggling uh, w with that. Um, and I'm wondering, therefore, um, seeking clarification, therefore, on two things. What possibly could not, what is not captured under the emergency measures uh, that would warrant this? That's my first yeah. question. Or Stefan, I'm not sure, is a legal question or a, a, a clerk question? Well, we'll start with Janet, if you want to switch it over to uh, Mr. Spackling, uh, that'd be fine. Um, okay, let me just look at, I've got a definite requiring immediate action. Um, we haven't had, the, through the chair, we haven't had instances other than the last emergency meeting that we had where we had to call the meeting without, without notice because uh, it did meet the um, requirements or the, the definition of emergency. As far as urgent or extraordinary, um, if we require council's um, permission to sign a contract and delegated authority hasn't been provided to a member of staff and we need to sign that document immediately because of a deadline. Um, uh, I'm uh, maybe Stephen has some other examples that would be urgent and extraordinary, but um, if I could just even clarify that because um, uh, uh, we had a, a fire, as everyone knows, in the form of Plastamid in the north end. If we had an emergency within the bounds of this city, uh, would our emergency services be precluded from responding immediately in the absence of a meeting of council? Giving that permission. Is that permission needed for an, our emergency services to respond? So, Janet, if it's okay because, with you. Stephen. Yes. Through the chair to Councillor Wilson. Um, I think what, what we're experiencing now, and your immediate question with regards to response of emergency and first responders, there are statutory requirements that are put in place with regards to flyer, ambulatory, ambulatory and police services. And so as a result, they have a statutory obligation they need to fulfill and they would respond in accordance with that statutory power. So when we look at the ability of a, an entity to operate within the municipal sphere, they either have statutory regulatory authority or it will be delegated authority through council. And that mm -hmm. can either be by a way of motion resolution or by a law. For emergency services and first responders, they have statutory authority and that what provides them with sufficient coverage. So I think in that situation, we would be concerned. When we look at the definition of emergency in the EMCPA, what we're primarily looking at is a statute designed to respond to natural disasters and disasters of that magnitude. And so it, it's in keeping with what we normally see, if there's a clear and present danger to personal injury, property damage, or something that's immediate that a response is required, it would meet the definition of emergency. What we're seeing pragmatically, and it's, it's not just us, other organizations and municipalities are seeing it, is an increasingly litigious environment where in which we are faced with situations where we may need to respond on an immediate basis to defend the interests of the city. And in the absence of delegated authority by way of resolution, motion, or bylaw, we would be forced to come back to council on very limited notice in order to seek the necessary instruction from council to defend the interests of the city. And I, those are the issues that we are struggling with immediately. And I believe that's the rationale why the city clerk looked at it and said there's a potential gap here from a procedural perspective. And although we hope we do not have to avail of it on a regular basis, in the event that a situation does arise where um, in my capacity as city solicitor, I need instruction direction from council that needs to be immediate to preserve the assets or interests of the city, then I'm able to obtain that without having to go through a notice requirement. Does that uh, answer your question, council? Could I just summarize what I think I've heard? And I, I'm gonna be really daft. But our emergency measures, our emergency personnel are required um, to respond immediately. Um, and there's no direction that needs to be provided from an elected body for them to do that. 
you referenced a natural disaster. So if I could just pick one out of the air, a, a flood, for example. Um, again, in responding to that, are you said, saying that our emergency services personnel would not be able to respond to that if, 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 if persons or property were at risk? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wilson, uh, no, absolutely not. Our emergency first responders would be able to respond. The issue would be the city's ability to respond in that situation outside of a first responder. So um, let's look at a situation where uh, we had a flood, for instance, natural disaster, a requirement. Uh, first responders would be engaged. There would be a statutory obligation uh, in which to be fulfilled. Whether um, we engage from a city perspective on water, wastewater, if we didn't have existing delegation of authority or instruction from council and something was required on an immediate basis, we could use the emergency provision to get in front of council to get that support. So if it was a, a budget item or something, and I mean, I'm not quite sure what it would be, because from an operational perspective, I'm sure there are issues that may arise that we haven't accounted for either by way of budget or other approval mechanisms. They may need to come forward immediately to get some direction from council. And they would be the situations where in which uh, an emergency would be captured there. Or if there's a response required on the city's behalf in order to preserve property that's on a grander scale. So flood going into, uh, let's say, into the, the lower uh, portion of the city, and we have a risk of significant damage to a number of people that would require us to make a decision with regards to diversion of water and those types of things. I think that's more along the lines of where it's city operations and not first responders that I think would be governed by that provision and that definition under the MCPA. Supplementary to that, though, and thank you, Stephen. I've only been on council for three years, but in that time, I don't recall ever being in receipt of a report um, seeking a delegated authority um, because we have identified something possible that would um, trip up our ability to respond on all fronts. And I, getting to the point of what constitutes then, like, you, you mentioned a, a heightened litigious environment, um, fair, but I, I'm not aware of uh, staff ever flagging something that, you know, possibly uh, should be delegated in the event of. Wouldn't that come first before this um, uh, um, amendment? Thank you. Uh, to the chair to Councillor Wilson, uh, we can certainly look at uh, a governance overview with regards to delegated authority and what exists today for the office of the city solicitor. And that's an exercise that we're currently undertaking to come back to council to say in situations where immediacy arises, it can either be dealt with through um, an urgent and immediate need through a, a, a meeting, a special meeting of sorts, or it could be by way of a delegated authority that exists by way of a bylaw amendment. And so we're currently looking in that situation to bring back to council to say, are there opportunities where we could provide for additional authority so that we would not need to invoke this mechanism? And to your first point, I don't see this as a mechanism that would be invoked on a regular basis. Uh, I don't. I see it as being an exceptional uh, tool to be used in limited circumstances. So I, I wouldn't see um, the meetings being called on a frequent basis in the absence of extenuating circumstances, because I believe transparency is something that's a concern uh, to the clerk, to myself, and to the city manager. So we would certainly want to ensure that where possible, notice is given to all affected parties, internal and external stakeholders. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm sure that would be the case. My struggle is we, we have never, I have never as a member of council as part of my governance responsibility received um, a, a briefing, a draft, a report uh, to inform me in the event of an emergency of X, Y, and Z, these powers, the, these things have already been delegated. So I'm just trying to hone in on what is it exactly um, that we can't respond to now. Um, as a municipality that would warrant this. Thank you. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wilson, uh, I think uh, Janet clearly had uh, identified one area and that's we're seeing, particularly with regards to COVID and other areas, um, immediate funding availability for uh, the city to uh, respond to either federal or provincial government funding. And that sometimes cry requires significantly tight turnaround with regards to agreement review and approval and sign off. So that's one instance where I can see. 
Um, when you look at from a legal perspective, there are equitable remedies available at law through the court systems, and they're usually injunctions, specific performance, or applications for mandamus to force an action. Those things can be taken on very limited notice provisions, and we may not be able to accommodate that within the confines of existing meeting uh, notice parameters, particularly for special meeting. Um, I will admit, though, it is very limited circumstance. You don't see it happen very often. And so, as I indicated, I don't see this as being a provision that would be availed of uh, on a frequency, a very frequent basis. Thank you. Okay. Are you, are you finished, Councillor? Yes, I'll take that. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, back to you. Yes, and I'll recognize Councillor Clark for a, a second time now. Thank, thank you, Chair. So I've been listening very intently and, and, and reflecting on everything that I'm hearing. And I'm trying to recall a time in the last three terms of council, um, two terms for me and plus my three years that I'm here, where item number seven would have been needed. Up till now, the two day notice for special, and then the act gives the emergency power to the mayor uh, to call an emergency meeting. I'm trying to, I, I'm really trying to understand why we need this third opportunity. And I can't, I can't come up with a reason that would satisfy it. Um, and my concern about not receiving information, <laughs> the last emergency council meeting, we had, I think it was two hours notice that, that where there was going to be an emergency council meeting. It happened that quickly on a, I think it was on a Friday. Um, and there was nothing, there was nothing in the e-scribe there was no reports to us we had absolutely nothing before us as to what that meeting was about and even then the decision was subjective that it was necessary to to have an emergency meeting rather than other meetings thursday we're having a special council meeting about mandating employees to get a vaccination but it's a special council meeting. That means, as far as I understand it, there can be no delegates. So we're hosting an emergency meeting or a special meeting, but we're creating it as a special council meeting, which cuts out the public completely from having an opportunity to address council. So those are the things that I'm concerned about, that the public don't get, they don't get appropriate notice and that the councillors are being asked to make a decision in, in, in item number seven, we're being asked to make a decision and all we're being told is in essence, the substance of, of, of why we need to have that meeting. But I need, I'm the guy that has to, you know, as a councillor, I have to decide whether or not I support that. And I don't know if I can support it if I'm not fully briefed in advance of making the decision to go to that meeting. And that's my challenge on this. Um, it, it, it still is problematic. So um, I'm concerned about item number seven, and I'm still concerned that even with two days notice, we're not receiving sufficient information um, to deliberate on. Um, so at the appropriate time, um, if we can sever out item seven, um, since there doesn't seem to be an appetite to change it, um, then we'll just simply have to vote on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vanderbeek. You're up for a second time. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I too am very um, concerned about number seven, even with two thirds amendment. Um, I'm wondering through you to staff, if someone could tell me if our procedural bylaw limits because we have something in our procedure bylaw about the mayor calling special council meetings, does that limit his ability to call an urgent or extraordinary meeting under the act instead of under our procedure bylaw? Deputy Clerk, are you able to answer that for us? 
Um, I defer this to uh, Stephen. Fair enough. To respond. Mr. Sprout. Um, certainly no problem. Through the chair to Councillor Vanderbeek, under the Municipal Act, Council has the ability to call a meeting without notice on majority. And so what we're looking at here is the procedural bylaw provides less subjective decision making authority to Council than what the Municipal Act provides. So our bylaw is more restrictive and provides for a greater threshold before a meeting can be called without notice. Uh, so the act does allow for um, less from a material threshold perspective to call a meeting. Uh, the introduction of item seven provides us with an intermediate step, which is still more than what the municipal act requires from the exercise of discretion, but it preserves the subjective decision-making authority of council to determine what is urgent and immediate and allows council to make that decision to decide whether or not it's worthy of uh, waiving the notice requirement and potentially uh, impacting transparency because as Councillor Clark has rightly mentioned, uh, we don't have sufficient time to allow for a delegation during a special council meeting. And so it, it's an intermediary step, uh, but our bylaw is more prescriptive and limited than what the Municipal Act allows for today. Thank you. And so uh, through you, Madam Chair, back to Stephen. Um, <clears throat> what I really was getting at is the fact that we have in our procedural bylaw the requirement of two days notice for a special council meeting. Does that mean that under no circumstances can the mayor call an immediate, urgent and extraordinary meeting? Through the councillor to councillor Van, through the chair to councillor Vanderbeek, uh, you're absolutely correct. The mayor's authority and discretion is limited to only those situations that meet the emergency requirements, and the definition is consistent with the MCPA. So we're looking at a situation where the mayor's authority is limited to only those emergencies by definition. Otherwise, it has to be on notice under the two-day requirement for special council. So thank you. And so um, through you, Madam Chair, back to Stephen. Um, I believe that we have waived the need for notice in the past in order to have a special council meeting. So uh, why can't we just do that? Why can't we as councillors understand why a special council meeting is required and then waive the notice at that council meeting for the two days notice? Uh, through the chair to councillor Vanderbeek, um, with regards to the exercise of discretion by council, it's certainly within uh, the confines of reasonable exercise of discretion for you to put that form of process in place. Uh, if you would like to proceed by way of um, the standard meeting notice, which we have today, the bylaw as it exists allows for you to waive that notice requirement. So that is something that procedurally exists today. Um, the, the intent behind introducing the new language was to provide for a third category of meeting that's not regularly scheduled uh, that would give you the ability to get a in-between emergency and a two-day special notice. Uh, but you're right, procedurally you can accomplish the same amount if you're able to get the necessary support to waive the notice of meeting. Generally, those things happen more so on the floor than in advance. Uh, because in advance, we have a, a procedural issue with regards to whether or not council can exercise uh, a majority. So we have to understand uh, how council is exercising their authority. When we see a special council meeting called from the floor and there's a, a notice for, to waive, it's more of an immediate requirement and people deal with that because they're currently in a regularly constituted meeting uh, so that they can effectively uh, govern themselves. And so I think it's certainly a procedural element that can be explored in greater detail to look at how that would work operationally. Thank you. And so I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sitting here thinking there's no reason we could, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, either you or the deputy um, clerk. So there's no reason we couldn't call a special GIC meeting and discuss whatever the issue is, if necessary, if we wanted to have the ability, even though there isn't much notice for someone to come and delegate and then call a special council meeting to deal with the urgent matter. If it was uh, something where delegations wouldn't be necessary because it's, as you, as you mentioned, an urgent legal matter, which would ordinarily be heard in camera, then 
the the reasoning for the special council meeting could be put forward to councillors and they could hear your report in camera and we could have a special council meeting directly after to resolve it if indeed that is what comes out of that, that in camera meeting is that correct uh through the chair to Councillor Vanderbeek, I believe that would be correct, but we would have to comply with the requirements for the calling of a special uh, GIC. And so there would still be notification and meeting requirements. And I defer to Janet with regards to the process on that from a clerk's office perspective, but we would not get around the immediacy requirement because we would have to meet the requirements to call a special GIC in order to be in that situation. So there would okay. still be some notice element required. And I don't want to interrupt you. So, but no, but if if we have to continue with the notice for a GIC meeting, and the mayor doesn't necessarily have under the municipal act or our procedural bylaw the ability to call a meeting like that without notice, <clears throat> and the mayor has the ability to call a special council meeting, wherein we could hear from you in camera, come back and make a decision. We have the ability to waive the notice for that specific purpose, correct? Mr. Sparland. Uh, it, through the chair to Councillor Vanderbeek, yes, I believe that is correct. Uh, in that situation, you would have the ability to waive a notice as council. Okay, so I'm having difficulty. I understand why clerks would suggest number seven, but, but I, like others, have never seen in my tenure on council or when I was working for the past councillor a need for that. And so I might be forgetting something, but certainly not in my tenure. Um, and so I, this causes consternation, this number seven. And I don't really see the necessity of it if we have the ability to continue to waive the, need, the notice for a special council meeting if we all agree that the mayor is going to call a special council meeting. I just don't see the need for this. I know it makes it easier, perhaps, for staff. Perhaps it makes it um, cleaner, but we're still, I mean, if we're going to go forward with this one, I'm going to put a motion forward about the two-thirds. I'm probably add a little extra wording that says, uh, notwithstanding the subsection on uh, urgent and extraordinary occasions, comma, with the informed understanding of the necessity and consent of two-thirds of all members of council. But, but I too agree that, that, that I think this is superfluous. I think it's superfluous. I think we have what we need to, to um, protect the public and transparency to the public and still do our business in an urgent way if we need to. And that can be explained by simply the, the title on the special council meeting that says it's a legal issue or you know uh, whatever whatever it is that we can share and we all agree that there there we need a special council meeting about it or we all complain about it when we get there or however it goes but but i think that i think that it's there i think it's there for a reason and i'm having some difficulty with that too so i have to decide whether or not i want to try this motion but i I'm really moving away from that simply because of my the conversation around the table here. And I think that, that it's probably better um, if the next council, uh, having heard our reasoning, um, if, 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 if this were to go through without number seven, it can always be added in a new term of council if that council feels that it's necessary. But, but I am having increasing difficulty with number seven as it stands right now and i don't think i'm going to put that motion forward thank you thank you um councillor vanderbeek any further comments or questions i recognize councillor ferguson yeah, just a question to uh the deputy clerk the only thing that's changing in our policy or proposed to be changing is the part that's bolded which is item seven everything else is already there correct through the chair, that's correct. Only item seven is what is being considered right now. Yeah, so we're not debating the whole policy. It's just number seven. Correct. Okay. I still don't have trouble with it. I like the way it goes, as, 
as our city solicitor said, it goes beyond the emergency requirements where it actually delineates and, and, and narrows the scope of when you can call a special meeting and, and uh, which is extraordinary. Uh, an urgent and extraordinary condition. And, and so I like that further delineation. So I still support item seven, but um, if Councillor Vanderbeek isn't going to put up her amendment, then we're simply gonna vote on the, rec the recommendation before us, which is mm -hmm. to create this item, new item seven. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I don't see any other um, speakers um, requesting some time. So uh, to to begin where Councillor Ferguson left off, there's no um, amendments on the floor. So uh, where we are right now is just an up or down vote on seven as it's set out in your package. So, correct, uh, Elsie? That is um, correct. correct. Um, Drew, to the chair, let me just make sure I have it up correctly. My apologies, I thought there was um, going to be some changes. No worries, it's okay. Yes. Madam Chair, can I ask one more question before we proceed? Of course, thank you, Councillor Clark. So can I just get confirmation from the clerk under our procedural bylaws, there is special meetings of council and they're handled. There is an emergency meeting of council, which is what the mayor has the authority to call as per the municipal act. And this is creating a new classification for meetings called an urgent or extraordinary meeting. Is that an accurate statement? Through the chair, yes it is. Thank you. So to the chair, I do have that ready now if uh if you're wanting to vote. Yes, uh, I don't see any further speakers. So uh, as presented, correct? Well, it's actually as amended because seven was an amendment that was referred back. It's just not further amended at this oh, point. Yes. Yes, so I'll, I'll pull that up. So if I may, our vote would indicate port for seven as Cor it's written. Correct, as it was written in um, the agenda. If I could seek further clarification, if the vote was, was to fail, for example, then um, as Clark's question, that third classification would therefore not be reflected in the procedural bylaw? Seven would not uh, be in the procedural bylaw. It would, at, it would end at six. Okay, thanks so much, Elsie no McRae. And the vote is up. And that is defeated by a vote of three to one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, members. Good discussion. Um, I'm going now to, am I going to adjournment? <laughs> to the chair, there are no other items on the agenda. I move okay. adjournment. It's moved by Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek to move to adjournment. Vanderbeek. I'm coming. Oh, no problem. <laughs> just need one minute. <laughs> there. I just couldn't get down through the layers. And that carries for nothing. Thank you all very much. Be safe and uh, stay hydrated. Thank you, everyone. Good job, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank